just um, texting one of our members, and of course, I uh, I was having difficulty operating the uh, the device. Um, and hang on, I just got a text back from that one member. Ah, good. You'll be joining us very shortly. But I see we have a quorum of members present. Um, we have Dr. Taylor and Joanne Bassetta. Um, we have two other members that are not yet uh, signed into our virtual meeting, but we have a um, uh, associate, uh, at least yeah, two, both uh, associate members present. So, and uh, I see Mr. Economy has just dialed in. So uh, we now have four of five members. Uh, <clears throat> and I would like to open the meeting by reading a script from the town about conducting virtual meetings. Um, if we don't have the fifth member uh, present, then we will ask one of the associates to fill in for the um, absent member. So, uh, good evening. This is an open meeting of the Board of Health. It's being conducted remotely, consistent with the governor's executive order. Due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth and the local state of emergency um, declared by the Board of Selectmen and by our board, the Board of Health, due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate transmission of the virus, the Selectmen have suspended all public gatherings in accordance with the governor's order, and all public bodies are encouraged to participate remotely. The governor's order allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the and board votes taken at the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation. This meeting may, be, uh, may incorporate public participation. Um, I would anticipate it would, but, um, and for this meeting, we are convening via the Zoom application as well as a telephone dial-in as posted on the meeting agenda on the town's website calendar, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is, uh-oh, I'm not sure if that was you or me, Dave, but there we go. <laughs> um, the, uh, the meeting is being recorded and some are, all attendees are participating by a video conference. Please be aware that other people may not be able to see you may be able to see you and that anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Uh, all of the materials for this meeting uh, are available in the public DocuShare folder and we recommend the members and the public follow the agenda as posted as the mm -hmm. chair notes, unless the chair notes otherwise. Um, meeting ground rules, we will open with the first item on the agenda. Um, I will introduce the speakers ask them to address the item. I'll go down the line of members, inviting them to provide comment. And um, further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair leads the floor to you and state your name before speaking. Members wish to engage in colloquially, colloquy with other members Here's a $2 word. Please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Um, and F, for items of public comment, after members have spoken, the chair may afford public comment as follows. The chair will first ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses and will be afforded um, a limited opportunity for comment or question. It suggests three minutes. We tend to be a little less formal, but you know, please remember that, um, you know, perhaps many people wish to speak and we need to make sure that everyone gets an opportunity. Um, also, because we're not live, most votes will be taken by roll call. So apologize for the additional delay that um, that incorporates. Okay, I've reached the end of the script. I do not see our member, Mr. Cruz. Mr. Cruz, if you're on the line, please speak up. Okay, I do not hear Mr. Cruz. Um, last time, Dr. Jacoby was our alternate. I believe this time then uh, Dr. Singh should be our alternate member, if that's acceptable to you, Drs. Jacoby and Singh. That's fine with me. That's, that's fine. Good. Very good. So Rico will be um, voting for Mike tonight. Um, 
So the first item on the agenda, as has been our practice for the last several meetings, is an op update on the current pandemic and other uh, pressing matters in town. So Cheryl, the floor is yours. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, so the first um, items I'm going to discuss are the Governor Baker's um, updates, just a few key points that have happened in the last couple of days. Um, so a couple of things that um, he noted was we're starting to see a downward trend in confirmed COVID-19 cases. And he also believes that the surge is behind us. The governor also announced that he's expanding nutritional assistance um, by expanding the SNAP benefits to uh, people uh, in need, which is a great uh, program. Um, so since the last meeting, um, we, as of today, um, Nara Park is partially open. Um, and users can, users can utilize the walking trails and the athletic fields for non-contact sports by the same household. The rec department's currently working on a phased reopening of other parts. So the reopening plan um, that will probably come next uh, will be the opening of the bathhouse, uh, which is where the uh, bathroom facilities are, and the beach um, as soon as safety pro protocols can be met and staff can be put in place. The health division did receive guidance yesterday from the state um, stating that municipal beaches can open um, on May 25th. We expect the beach opening to take place though sometime in June um, and we will be following the state issued beach guidance for managers dated May 18th. Um, that requires social distancing, wearing of face coverings except when swimming, um, keeping your towels at least 12 feet, no organized sports, six feet uh, separation um, with the lifeguard stations. So, so there's some other um, sort of safety protocols that we have to follow, but those are some of the key ones. Um, so last night, the Board of Selectmen met and they voted um, to fund a residential rent rental assistance program in the form of grants to eligible households to maintain housing during this pandemic with demonstration of need and if qualifications are met. The Board of Selectmen also voted a small business relief program with funds to eligible businesses that can be utilized for expenses not covered by other federal or state relief programs, again with determination of need, eligibility, criteria, and requirements. Both of these programs will be funded through the CARES Act funding the town will be receiving in FY20 and 21. The CARES uh, Act funds are restricted to necessary expenses for the public health emergency caused by COVID-19 um, only. So um, in addition, the Board of Selectmen also um, discussed allowing temporary outdoor seating to allow um, restaurants to be able to create the outdoor seating um, so they can be in compliance, hopefully with the next uh, order that the governor does by lifting the restrictions of uh, eating in a restaurant. And we're suspecting that maybe those will be outdoor seating only. So. Um, the Board of Health took care of that last night for us. That's all I have, Bill. Works better when I'm off mute. Uh, thank you very much, Cheryl. Uh, appreciate that. Ask if uh, any members of the board have questions or comments for the health director. So this is different in the virtual world. I have to wait to see if anyone unmutes. And I see Mr. Connaby has just unmuted. So please go ahead, Mark. Yeah, quick question. Do we need to do anything at this meeting or in the future meetings regarding the outdoor seating for the restaurants or can that be done administratively by the department? Um, so the way the way it works typically is um, we don't um, not allow outdoor seating. I mean, we being the health division. So um, as long as they're not in excess of their allowed seat count. So um, you know, I don't foresee um, bringing this back to the board unless you'd like us to. Um, but I do know that um, planning, police, um, health, building, um, a, a lot of different departments are going to be involved. Um, we're we're going to require an application. The application, um, we have 10 days to respond to them. And um, we will, you know, make sure all protocols are met, all health you know, uh, any Board of Health um, regulations in regards to restaurants, but, and then the seating is our biggest thing. Um, but it seems to me like they're not going to allow indoor um, seating at this point. I'm not 100% sure on that, but if they don't, 
it's kind of a no-brainer to take those seats from the inside and bring them to the outside. Michelle, this is a so perhaps a trivial question, but how about restrooms, both for hand washing and for you know? Uh, yeah. So um, you know, from what I'm, I, you know, until we get actual guidance from the governor, I don't know what is going to be restricted and what's not. Um, but I'm hoping that if the restaurants are located in the back, that the back door could be open or the side door could be open to minimize the patrons' um, a need to go into a restaurant. I do know that in Rhode Island, um, they have outdoor seating approved and you can go into the restaurant to use the facilities. So I'm suspecting that we'll have the same guidance. Okay, that makes sense. Any other questions or comments for the director from members of the board? In that case, are there any questions or comments from members of the public? Are you showing anyone with a hand raised, Cheryl? I do. I have two hand raised. Well. All right, so we have Colin user number one. Ah, very good, please go ahead. It's Tara from West Acton, <coughs> and I have a question for Cheryl. Um, that I also wanted to you know, see what you guys all thought of this too, but uh, there was a memo, I think it might've come out today or yesterday, um, from John Mangerati about opening up restaurants. Um, it's a bit part of a small business relief package, and the last part of it is, is allowing restaurants to open in the parking spaces and, and all that. And I would like to know, if, A, if Cheryl read it, uh, B, if the members of the board have read it, and what your um, uh, you know positions are or opinions are, when you're going to discuss it if you um, don't already have followed positions. Um, but the Economic Development Committee and sort of other boards are moving forward as if this is already going to be happening. And I had a concern, um, which I expressed that I would like very much to know what the Board of Health thinks about the memo and what was outlined in the memo. So I have read the memo. I have not given that memo to the board. As you mentioned, it just came out today. If the board wishes, I can include that in the next packet for discussion. But um, what, what it really talks about is, um, you know, making sure that this is done safely. So that's pretty much the gist of the memo, but I'd be happy to forward it to you if you'd like. Thank you. No, what I was really wanting to know is, are you okay with it? Do you think that what was laid out in there is realistic and safe and all that? Well, I think we need an opportunity to to review each case. So, you know, one of the things that we discussed today was, um, for example, if someone wants to utilize some parking space to create outdoor seating, that they may need to bring in like Jersey barriers or or something similar to create some safety. But uh, it's a little too soon to say what we're going to require. I mean, there's things that are things that are out there, Tara, but not you know nothing etched in stone. And I think each case is going to be a little bit um, different. Okay, thank you very much. That answers my question. All right, is uh, there another person? I do, um, John Peterson. If you can state your name and address, that'd be great. Thank you. Should we be able to talk, John? Hi, uh, sorry about that. I was looking for the unmute. Um, thanks very much. This is uh, John Peterson, 6 Jackson Drive. Um, not really sure if this is a right question for Cheryl or this is even the right point in the agenda, but I wanted to check and see if people had taken note of uh, two emails that I sent, one about a week ago and one um, yesterday on the subject of monitoring uh, COVID-19 and sewage. Um, and I was particularly attracted to this approach in terms of community health because it gets a pooled sample. You know, unfortunately, we don't sample all of Acton by that process, but we do obviously get a good um, significant sample of Acton by looking at that. So I wanted to check and see if people had read that and if um, people were going to try and get in contact with BioBot and see if we might uh, become part of that program. So um, the the health, health division no longer does the sewage. It's done through uh, Corey York. So I forwarded your uh, email to him, John. Um, you know, we do have a private um, company manage our treatment plant. So there may be concerns with that. But um, I really think you should direct your conversation to him. Have you, have you spoken to him? I, I did, you know, copy John um, Manchurati because I wasn't really sure operationally how best to do that. But if Corey's the person, I will follow up with him. 
Okay, sounds good. All right. Well, thank you very much for your interest. I see Mr. Martin has physically has his hand up. I, I just wanted to say with regard to the uh, outdoor seating um, that the, the, the rules being proposed don't change any health-related rules at all. They just open up more space in which to apply those rules, right? So, you know, if, if a restaurant, again, as Cheryl mentioned earlier, we don't know if restaurants are going to be allowed to have indoor seating at this time. But if, if for outdoor seating, if they you know, would have 200 square foot feet normally or 500 square feet, whatever it is, but if they did these other things, maybe use some grass area, maybe use some unused parking spaces, they might be able to double the space where they could have outdoor seating. So it just has to do with outdoor seating. It does, I mean, the space for outdoor seating, it doesn't change or try to apply any, any health rules. Those health rules remain the same. Very good. Thank you. Okay, if there's no other uh, no other comments uh, this time on the agenda. Next on the agenda is an update from the uh, nursing director uh, Heather, who I believe is available virtually. Yes, I do see your your name, Heather. Would you mind uh, updating us? Sure, Bill. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so, just a quick update: uh, the total numbers um, in act and as of today are 165 cumulative positive cases within town with 47 that are currently active in isolation, 97 that have recovered and 21 fatalities. Um, I haven't seen any trends. I know the governor has talked about um, a downward trend. We have had some days where we haven't had any new positive cases, but then other days we've had, you know, two, three or four positive cases within a 24 hour period. Um, you know, so we'll wait to see you know, as, as the days go by, what happens and what happens with, um, you know, the reopening um, in phase one. Um, the updated numbers for Benchmark, the Inn at Robinsbrook, um, currently they have 10 residents overall that have had uh, COVID-19, six staff, um, and they last week had been... Um, a resident within the memory impaired unit had gone to the hospital for other reasons other than COVID symptoms, but going to the ER, they did test this resident and the resident did come back positive. So they reached out to uh, the National Guard and the whole building was tested again for a second time. They've done that already in the past um, and only four residents tested positive and none of them were symptomatic. Um, they've all been isolated. Um, there were two staff members that uh, were recognized also as new positives, also without symptoms, and they are in isolation. Um, so they did a good job with following up on having those folks tested pretty quickly. And the numbers for life care of Acton overall, they have had 63 residents um, test positive in the last um, however many weeks this has been. I've lost track. 21 staff members. The good news is they've moved 20 of those residents off of isolation in the last week and a half, um, which is great news who have recovered. Uh, they've also not had, knock on wood, any new symptomatic residents or positive residents in, I think, seven days, which is great news. Um, so they're doing a really good job over there. And I know that Chris Foy was on um, last Monday's meeting, I believe, with an update from there. Um, other than that, you know, we're following the guidelines per the governor. Um, working with, of course, Cheryl and her department, as well as um, management about, you know, working to get the staff back into town buildings um, and, 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 you know, weaning back from the virtual side of things on a, on a slow level per the governor's guidance. Um, other than that, I think, I think that's really all that's new for me. Okay, well, thank you. I mean, uh, uh, at least you um, you have seen some days where we've seen a downward trend, and hopefully that will become a much more consistent pattern. Um, hopefully. 
I was just curious. The CDC announced some statistics this past week, and I was just curious how close they correlated with Acton. Uh, one, it said that 50% of the deaths occurred in congregate living facilities. Was it, is that close to Acton's experience or different? I think we're, I think our percentage is a little higher, but I say that with caution just for the fact of some residents that ended up in the hospital, we don't always get what the outcome is. They have either been um, transferred to a rehab facility after their hospitalization. They could still be in the hospital or of course, there could have been a fatality, and, and we don't get all of those numbers, so I do say that with caution. Um, but yes, as of now, the numbers that I have um, do show the um, congregate living is the higher percentage, unfortunately. Yeah, well, it, uh, I guess it's instructive, should we ever have a second wave, we know a little bit more about what to do. Um, the other one, and I think I know the answer to this, but CDC reported, and this surprised me, that the mortality or the, the death rate from COVID-19 based on their uh, statistics is a quarter of a percent, so 0.26%. Is that of the, you know, in other words, of the positive cases, 0.26% of them were turned into fatalities. Is that close to Acton's statistics or are we better or worse? You know, I'd have to do that number to be honest with you. Okay. But like That's, I said, I don't have the total number of fatalities because I don't always get all of that information, unfortunately. No worries. Last question. Just in this, um, I will make sure that I, I preamble it by saying, seriously, when you get a chance and get a breather from all of the current activities, and there are reports that toward the end of this year, there might be a vaccine available at some point. I don't have any basis to believe that is true or not true, but but being uh, you know thoughtful or or um, uh, trying to plan ahead at some point. Well, like I say, when you get a breather, we might want to talk about what the protocol would be, what um, assistance you would need from the board of health, what assistance you might need from the select board. Um, how would we actually go about this? What facilities might you need? Whatever. Whatever uh, you know, we can put in place so that that when that day comes, I'm on a meeting, uh, Mr. Peterson. I think you're also off mute. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um. So anyway, when that day comes, that perhaps uh, you know we we already have a plan that we've had a chance to give some uh, some thought to. So, like I said, please don't make that a priority because I know you're completely occupied at the moment. No, it's a really good to think about that ahead of time. I mean, I'm already thinking about um, flu season. You know, we've already ordered flu vaccine. You know, the planning of how we're going to do that again um, will really be determined by this pandemic. You know, in my first thought of doing any kind of immunization would be as a drive through clinic again. Um, that we've done numerous times at the transfer station successfully, you know, using um, Cheryl's department's use of um, hazardous waste day, similar to that where the cars, you know, come in, drive around the building, drive through the building. There's different locations with nursing staff set up to inoculate residents while they're in their cars. And it has worked beautifully in the past. We did it for quite a number of years, but then wanted to expand um, because we had lost some of the demographic in town, specifically the senior demographic when we started doing it that way. So we did end up changing it to more in, in back into the buildings, but that obviously will have to be reassessed depending on where we are. So I'm thinking of that already. I, you know, I do have, I had a message from one of the school nurses regarding it because we've done it at the high school the last few years. Um, so I, I don't think that will be an option in September, you know, just with how things are going. So, you know, I'm thinking of those things. So that would, you know, that'll help plan for that eventuality. 
Okay. Well, very good. Like I said, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad to, to know, as I suspected that you're already thinking about it, but I can say when we, uh, when we get a breather, maybe we should, um, talk about what we have to do specifically. And like I say, how we can, how we can help or how the select board can help. Sure. That sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time I'll ask do other members of the, um, Board to have questions for Heather, and I see Ms. Massetta has unmuted. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, good evening, Heather. Um, I must have read the same uh, article that uh, Bill McGinnis read about some recent CDC statistics, and um, I'm wondering if we or the, the town knows how many people have actually been tested, um, just so we could get a sense of um rate of infection versus folks who've been tested um it seems like um, massachusetts is sort of behind a lot of other states in terms of gathering that type of information and disclosing it to uh, uh local boards of health so i don't have that number off the top of my head but i believe there is a way to pull a report off the MAVEN reporting system um, because once the test results are posted, what we see immediately are any suspect contact or positive cases that come through the state system. We don't necessarily, you know, get sent every test that has been done, but I believe there's actually a report that I can pull that I could potentially look at that number. I'd, I'd have to go digging for it, but I, I can look to see what there is for you. I'd be happy to do that. If it's not too laborious, that just might be uh, informative, but if it's um, a pain in the neck, um, you've got other things to do. So uh, thank you. <laughs> right. Well, thank you. Um, so Dr. Taylor had also unmuted, but then he suddenly dropped off the view, at least in front of my screen. Dr. Taylor, are you on the line and did you have a question? Uh, no, I'm on the telephone because um, the video or the and the audio didn't work on Zoom. Ah. <clears throat> okay, but you don't have a question for Heather, then I take it, since you're still on mute. Okay. No question. Very good. All right. Well, in that case, if there are no other questions from members of the board, I'll ask if there's any questions from members of the public. Cheryl, do we show anyone wishing to ask a question? I do. I have um, John Peterson. Mr. Peterson, please go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Can you hear me? Yeah. We can. Great. Um, so I wanted to actually to make um, two comments. One is that in the state, the percentage of deaths in congregate living is 61%, and that's been you know consistent for the last um, little bit of time. You know, as um, Heather rightfully commented, although people think of death as being a very certain thing, in point of fact, the tracking of deaths and you know how deaths are ascribed to things is a little bit complicated, especially when there are comorbidities. So you need to look at those numbers with a grain of salt. I, I think the more important thing is for the purposes of the Board of Health, you know, in, in the minutes, when there are discussions of uh, fatality rates, I think it's important to distinguish between uh, the infection fatality rate, which is always, a, you know, a calculated value because nobody knows exactly how many, many infections there are, and the case fatality rate, which is based on uh, the number of confirmed cases. So when you refer to that lower number from the CDC, um, that's an infection fatality rate. And the numbers that I've seen, you know, for the infection fatality rate are a big range because nobody knows exactly what the infections are, but range more from, you know, about a half a percent up to 1% um, than the, uh, you know, the, the, the 0.25 is, is a little bit of an outlier. You make a good point, Mr. Peters, and I was just uh, looking to see what the, our local experience was compared to what was reported as a national experience. And I realize that you know the statistics are are not um, uh, perfect or crisp. So um, yes, all all such data should be carefully interpreted and 
before we draw conclusions, we should examine it carefully. However, I do think there is one conclusion, which is, I said, if we're faced with a second wave, we should be mindful of, and that is the congregate living facilities do seem to have a particularly difficult time. And so maybe we need to think about how we can try to make that be uh, less of a problem should we be faced with a second wave. So that was part of the the um, the item for discussion. But thank you for your comments. Uh, Charles, is there anyone else from the public that wish to comment? No. Very good. Well, in that case, somebody, somebody just raise their hand if you want me to call on them. Sure. All right, uh, Kevin Thomas. Go ahead, Kevin. Hey, how are you guys doing? Um, I joined late, sorry. Um, I was just curious, was there a discussion on the athletic fields? I'm actually with um, Youth Baseball for Acton. And we were That's actually um, in our own board meeting, and I jumped over to this one because we're trying to figure out what the summer plan is and if there's any update on the um, athletic fields. But there will be. That is actually an item scheduled for discussion, so you haven't missed okay. it. But I would I've take it. it. You have not missed it. Yeah, but um, I would take a guess that you're probably somewhere 15 minutes to half an hour away from that discussion. Okay. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, in that case, um, I'd like to move on to the next agenda item, which is other updates. Do we have other updates, Cheryl? No, and in actuality, I should have put that at the end, but I put the other things uh, before it, but I don't have any other updates. Okay, very good. Then that brings us to the breeding beaver trapping permit for 693 Mass Ave. All right, so this is a request from the Acton Water District. Um, we've seen this request in years past. Um, what's happening now is the, the beavers are damming the culvert, which is causing water to back up um, close to the district's well fields on Mass Ave. So the health department's recommending issuance um, of this permit due to that public health threat. Okay, very good. Very good. Um, usual questions. Does the district have a uh, trapper in mind? Sorry, okay. they do. I'm muting myself. Very good. Uh, questions from members of the board? Are they looking for both a breaching and trapping permit since it only says trapping on the agenda? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. I should have put both. Any other questions, comments from members of the board? In that case, anyone wish to uh, make a motion to um, uh, move this item? So moved. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Mr. Conaby. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Bassetta. We have a motion made and seconded to issue the uh, review for trapping permit in accordance with the uh, health department's permit. I'll uh, take a roll call vote. Uh, let's see. All those in favor, please say aye, and I will start with Ms. Bassetta. Aye. Very good. Dr. Singh. Aye. Mr. Conaby. Aye. And Dr. Taylor. Aye. And I also vote aye. Motion carries unanimously. Very good. Well, that then brings us to the next agenda item, which is the house uh, discussion on household hazardous waste day. Cheryl? Right, so I had brought this to you about a month ago, and we decided to wait um, to decide on what we should do closer to the event. Um, so we're getting close to the point where we would need to advertise for this event. Um, so I'm looking for board guidance. Um, you know, I did try to do a little research this week um, to see what other communities are doing. Um, and it appears that the uh, facility in Minuteman, um, which Acton residents can go to, um, which is in Lexington um, at the DPW building, uh, they can, Acton residents can utilize it, but since we're not a member, um, there would be a fee associated with that. So I looked at what they were doing, um, and currently they've canceled everything that they had scheduled. So, um, uh, you know, up until today's date. And then um, they had some 
um, item on the, they had other dates on the agenda that have not been canceled yet. So I reached out to them to see what their plan was, <coughs> excuse me, and they, um, and they didn't get back to me, unfortunately. So I think they probably undecided what, what they're going to do with those days. So then I looked at the Devons facility, um, which is in Shirley, that active residents do not have a right to go to um, because you have to be a member. But um, they are closed uh, indefinitely. So then I reached out to Clean Harbors, and I asked if they were indeed running events, and they indicated that they are. Um, so they're running them, you know, fairly similar, you know, no resident, fairly similar to what we do. So as you know, now we do, um, it, you, the residents come, they wait in line in their car, they drive around the DPW building, they enter into the DPW building, the, um, the worker for Clean Harbors will uh, go open the resident's trunk uh, take the chemicals out, and um, and then the person goes on their way. So it's a fairly contactless event, except for the fact that the workers are touching the vehicles. Um, so, you know, we, we talked to staff uh, about this, and, you know, a couple of my staff have, have reservations about doing it. Um, you know, so I, I decided it might, might be best to, to run it by you. So what I also did inquire with Clean Harbors to see, because um, right now we're we're a, a couple months shy of the next event, which is scheduled for September, um, the beginning part of September. I don't have the date in front of me, um, so we're getting close to that event. Um, so I did reach out to see if maybe we should consider doing one event, you know, right smack in the middle of the year, like July of, or August, but they do not have any dates available. So. The question to you is, you know, should we keep the event in June or just hold the one in September? Okay, thank you. Um, well, uh, I guess my first thought, and I'll certainly pull other members, but my first thought is uh, that September is probably about the right time to consider an event. Um, and you know, whether we actually hold it in September, we probably can decide a little later in the year. But I think, uh, whereas you're correct, we can probably do it with relatively minor risk to both the residents and the staff, because it, like you say, it is, um, you know, people stay in their cars. The only time I'm aware that you have to get close to the driver is when we try to verify residency, and perhaps we can think of some other method of doing that, you know, have them um, get mailed a placard or a sticker or a piece of paper and you know encourage them not to even roll their window down uh so there might be a way to do that but i'm not sure that the urgency is necessitates you know doing that um earlier than say september so that would be my view but i'd ask other members of the board what is what are your opinions dr taylor yeah yeah can you hear me? We can hear you. All right, good. I can't tell when I'm on or off mute, but um, I think we should skip it. Okay, so skip it and skip the one in June, or skip the one in September, or both. Well, I would skip this one definitely, um, and then I would wait and, and make a decision later on the second one. Okay. Very good. Any other members wish to comment? Mr. Economy. Yeah, I concur. We're still at a safer at home advisory and it doesn't sound like it is going to be that easy to get the logistics within the time frame. I think we we'll probably have to do reservations and things like that that probably space people out. But you know, we still have restrictions at the transfer station and safer at home advisory. So it seems prudent at this time to uh, consolidated towards the fall. Very good, thank you. Other comments from members of the board? Dr. Jacoby. Yeah, that, yeah yes, that, um, I agree with postponing it. I mean, theory, in theory, you could get it going in, in June, but then would anybody show up is questionable. So um, I think Holding on to your hazardous waste for another couple of months is not all that 
series of hardships. So I would say let's do it in September. Very good. Thank you. Other uh, comments? So, Cheryl, I think um, it sounds like we have a fairly uh, coalesced or unanimous consensus that certainly um, cancel the one in June. And sometime, I'll say around July, we should probably consider whether we wish to go forward with the one in September. Does that provide the uh, information you were looking for? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. So that does bring us to the next, the uh, discussion of uh, tennis courts and athletic fields. Mr. Thomas, you're now in, on time, but um, I'd open with asking Cheryl if she'd please introduce the topic and give us the latest guidance from the state. So um, we did get, um, we did get guidance. Um, we, we had, there was a conference call today um, that we got guidance and um, the guidance was, you know, um, the, the, the topic of the conversation today was more um, the difference between private and public and what's allowed to be open. So since our last meeting, um, we received guidance that said, no, they can't be open. And then we received guidance that said they could be open. So um, I, I did question the state. Um, I had a couple of our tennis organizations also pose a question and everybody received the same answer. So um, we, we have had some guidance um, that suggested that it was only for use among um, uh, Hussein households, similar to what we did in NARA. Um, but um, today's talk did not, um, does not address that. It was basically tennis is open, phase one, um, my only um, reservation that I have now is, um, you know, if you look at the phase guidance from the governor, the reopening plan, um, he has some uh, youth programs listed out, I think in, uh, I forget if it's phase, I think it's phase three. Sorry, I don't have that in front of me. But um, so I've asked for clarification just on like youth tennis programs, because since it's clearly outlined in another um, document that says, that, that should be a different phase. I do have clarification on that. But for now, um, I've, I've spoken with um, Aaron Batez from the school, um, uh, community ed, uh, who manages those uh, courts at the, the school owned ones, and then um, our rec director. And our rec director, as you can see in the packet, um, is, is recommending that we follow um, the guidance of uh, the parks the parks guidance that um, uh, that the parks and open space guidance that that you've all seen before. I don't think I included it in today's packet, but it's the same guidance where we open Narrow Park. Um, and it and it, and I feel confident that um, the state is now allowing tennis to be open, even though it was such a back and forth for a while. Um, and, and the rec director, um, both Aaron Batez and the rec director have discussed maybe scheduling just to just try to prevent people from congregating at the fields. And there are conditions that they have to meet, as she suggested in, um, in her guidance. Um, and those are taken directly from the state's um, guidance for opening parks and, and athletic fields and, and recreation. So I also um, put a slash athletic fields on this. Uh, agenda topic because uh, agen um, athletic fields are pretty clearly also state that they can be open and again without um, without having to be in the same household which is what we what we um, voted for NARA um, you know and they even go as far as saying the state I mean goes as far as saying that outdoor classes can be held on these athletic fields so we're getting a big push um, from a lot of different groups, uh, yoga, um, a gym. So we, the, today in the conference call that we were on with the state, um, they specifically told us that that is an allowed use on athletic fields. So, um, and you know, and there can be like a dance studio can operate outside on an athletic field, uh, yoga, gyms, um, you know, personal fitness. And, and again, they all have, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, conditions. So, and the conditions are, 
you know, six feet of separation between the participants, 12 feet of separation between um, activity stations, face coverings required, no shared equipment, gatherings must be less than 10 people, class must have pre-registration process, temporary signage needs to be in place, and all equipment must be disinfected after use. So pretty clear guidance today from the state's conference call. Um, so I would like the board to discuss potentially allowing the opening of athletic fields and um, tennis courts. Now, when we voted previously, the vote was specific to athletic fields, not to tennis courts. Okay, thank you very much. If I can just uh, summarize, make sure I got this right. The state's guidance now is that tennis is permissible in phase one. Um, the, I don't know if this came up, but is that indoor and outdoor or just outdoor only? <laughs> Uh, I think it's just outdoor. It's just outdoor at this point. Okay, fair enough. And then uh, we have a proposal from the rec director on how to open the tennis courts, um, the public courts, obviously. The outdoor ones would apply to both public and private, I presume. No distinction between the two? Correct. Okay. And then just for uh, Mr. Thomas' sake, since he's been patiently waiting, I think what I also heard you say is that youth programs like youth baseball are not going to be a phase one activity. Is that probably more like phase three? Yeah, so there's um, there's somebody wrote in our chat that, um, and I, I'm sorry, I probably should look that up before the meeting, but um, adult softball, so they allow for organized practice apparently in phase two, and then phase three will allow the competition. And the same with like the youth sports. Okay. So um, in that case, given the, uh, what we have before us is opening the athletic fields to, and I suspect this is gonna be tossing the select board a little bit of a conundrum, but um, opening athletic fields to activities, permitted activities and opening tennis courts um, in line with the recreation director's uh, guidance or suggested policies. To ask at this time if there are comments or questions uh, on the proposal for members of the board. Dr. Taylor, you lit up. Did you have a com uh, comment? No, I'm, I'm unmuted since I can't tell one way or the other. No comments. Oh, so we just heard your breathing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Mr. Connaby. Yeah, I, I'm a little concerned because we have as we have posted rules and requirements, and then we have conference call guidelines, which are in contravention of it. And when we checked with the state last week regarding this, they said you can email them for clarification. They'll provide a written answer. And I think that that's really the next step. I mean, the tennis courts, it seems like it's pretty, they are pretty consensus that outdoor is allowed. There's questions about it, but you know, you need to get that answer. But I think for the athletic fields, for all these different organizations, it says no, it, and the guidance is published. And I would want to have it in writing from them that they're, they've changed what is published so we know that that's an appropriate action to take. And then once we take it, it's going to have to be implemented safely, which like direct department says it has to have some time to do so. So it, they would be able to be reopened subject to a plan and the requirements and the guidance being implemented. So I, I guess I'm a little concerned about quote, opening up the athletic fields. As we talked about last time, if you say, well, the fields are open, open to home for how much? How are you gonna enforce it? What are the guidelines? It's different than it's being published. We're supposed to enforce what's being published. We're getting guidance, which is different. It seems like a conundrum. We really need to get the specific answers. So if there's something which is different than what's posted, we should get an email back from them that they said they will do to say what's allowed, what's not allowed before we go forward. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Cheryl, did you have anything uh, to add to that or do you have any? You no, know, uh, I think the conversation, the conference call today was basically because people were emailing them and we decided to address it in our daily call. Um, so I feel confident that I can get that in writing um, if, if that's what the board wishes. Um, I did email, um, I, did, I did use email today, um, but I didn't get a response back before the meeting. But my question 
was more, um, it did cover the whole gamut of what I just talked about, but my question to them more was about the youth programs for the tennis. But I can, I can get that clarification in writing. Okay, very good, thank you. Other questions or comments from Dr. Jacoby? I see you've uh, unmuted. Yes, I had a question. Just in reading the document uh, that Cheryl provided, it says to use the Elm Street courts. Is that because the other tennis courts are controlled by the school district? And if so, do they have a plan on opening? We, we've been talking um, with, I've been talking um, when we email, when we're talking email, we're talking, I'm talking to both the schools and the rec director for Acton. But yes, this document only addresses um, uh, the Elm Street courts because that's the only one that the um, the, the town does, uh, you know, uh, or what, what's the word for it, town um, overseas. So, um, but the, um, I have also spoken to the, the schools and they're basically just waiting for guidance from you. So they're, they're on board with opening. Um, they just, I'm waiting for the guidance. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, anyone else wish to make a comment? Okay, um, Joanne. Well, actually, sorry, I have a question just based on that last statement. So um, assuming that um, we uh, affirm um, the opening of outdoor tennis courts with the conditions noted by the recreation director, we can um, then um, allow the tennis courts under the school district's jurisdiction the same, or do we have to vote on that separately or have something in writing? I guess it's just more of a process question. Well, I would, I would uh, anticipate, uh, Joanne, that if we, um, we made a board of health policy that that would be applicable to any of the town organizations. Um, so I, I would think we could do it with one vote. That would be my suggestion. Uh, Bill, isn't there some management involved in this? Taking reservations, oversight, supervision, can the town handle that? Well, that's... Food? <laughs> That's probably a question that um, that we're not prepared to answer, but I mean, Cheryl, did that come up at all? We've had those conversations, Dr. Bill. Um, you know, I think it, with anything, you know, the same with opening NARA, it's, it's unfortunately, it's going to be a process. So, um, and we, you know, clearly will not open until um, all the guidance um, that the state has outlined is met. I mean, it's a condition of opening. So um, there's okay. no question that it would have to be. Um, Follow all that guidance. Thank you, uh, Cheryl. Thanks. Okay. Well, I would actually um, uh, offer my opinion, which is, uh, I think, very close in line with where Joanne was going, which is that, uh, you know, to Mark's point, <laughs> we've struggled with this now. I think this is at least the third week that we've sort of struggled with this. And it's because, you know, the guidance has been mushy when we've asked for specific answers we get things like please re please refer to the governor's policy it's like no we that's the source of the confusion not the resolve of the confusion so um so i i certainly understand that i guess what i would suggest is you know subject to explicit confirmation that of what cheryl said is the state's guidance it seems that what the health director proposed, excuse me, the recreation director has proposed seems like reasonable conditions to reopen the, at least the tennis courts. Um, so that would be my suggestion. Um, but obviously it would be up to a member to, um, to move that forward should they wish to. So moved. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Bassetta. Is there a second? I don't hear a second. Second. Ah, Dr. Thank Singh. You. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Uh, very good. A motion has been made and seconded. Is there further discussion from members of the board? Bill, by your motion, you're saying that it would be, so we'd have written confirmation that it is an allowed uh, activity from the state as part of this phase 
to allow the recreation department to move forward to open it subject to its ability and guidelines. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Cheryl ask if there's any comments or from the members of the public. Um, I'll look in one second, but can I just ask one question? Is this in regards to both tennis and the athletic fields or just tennis? Uh, well, the rec director's guidance, I believe, is specific to tennis. So um, perhaps what we would like is a similar plan for the other activities. So this gets slightly complicated, and I, I apologize for the digression, but what I was thinking of is like yoga classes, dance classes on athletic fields. Most of the athletic fields are not privately owned. They're, they're town-owned, and that's why I said it becomes a perhaps a select board issue is they would need to allocate how they would let other groups or organizations use town facilities to conduct their activities. I'm not suggesting that's a bad thing to do, but that's not our board's um, purview, I don't believe. <clears throat> and if they were to say, allow another organization or activity to use um, athletic fields, I think having that organization present a plan to the health director is similar to what has been presented for tennis would be a good idea. I mean, it could be very simple. The one for tennis is less than a page, but it shows awareness and, and practices that are consistent with the state's guidance. And, and I think that would be a good thing to suggest. Um, so, you know, we could, we could make a policy in line with that perhaps tonight if the members were in favor of it, or we could wait until you have some actual proposals. Um, yeah, because for, for those uses, I do have that documentation in writing from the state from today's conference call about the outdoor classes. Um, you know, it, I think I read you all the conditions that they said would need to go forward. And I do believe that both the school and the rec department already have mechanisms in place on how to rent those fields to people or let them use them or they're already in place because they've been doing that for years. Okay, I would assume they'd have to share it, but Mark, I see you have a comment. Yeah, I think we should be doing tennis first, but uh, I just can't reconcile having group activities that are private of things that are specifically said they're in the next phase and are not allowed to be now allowed by a specific conference call guidance changing things. I, I'd want to see it in writing before we do it and then a plan. I don't think we should be doing it on the fly at the last minute. This got added this afternoon. Things are changing so fast. We don't need, we still, we still see a trend going up um, slowly, thank goodness, but it just doesn't seem like a good proven policy and it's not consistent with the safer at home or the other guidance, the recommendations that have been issued. So, Okay. We need to be cautious, and I would say, get it in writing, let's review it, and then make a decision. Okay, well, I certainly agree with your, your um, I, well, I agree with your comment, but uh, the first part was that we, we have a motion made in second in regarding tennis. Uh, we, we had a brief digression there, but I believe it should be time to vote. So all those in favor, I'll go down the, um, the list. I'll start from the bottom and move up this time. Dr. Taylor. Uh, I vote aye. Mr. Connaby. Subject to confirmation of state, aye. Very good. Dr. Singh. Aye. And Ms. Bassetta. Aye. I also vote aye, so motion carries unanimously. So to Cheryl's point about athletic fields, um, I did hear her say, and so offer her the opportunity to comment, that that actually guidance you do have in writing I do. I mean, it was from the conference call, as, as Mark just pointed out. Um, but after the conference call, they sent us an email, and I'm reading it right from that email. Um, so I do believe that allowing those classes is clear guidance. Um, you know, and honestly, um, you know, allowing this kind of use at a field to me is better protection than just allowing the general public to, to go on the field. We're having somebody there who is responsible. Um, for that group, um, we can assure that they, you know, uh, give us their safety protocols before we can even allow them to to use the space. Um, 
you know, I, I, I think that I also think that the, the governor's order is definitely, um, you know, not restrictive of only allowing private classes, but to me, private classes seems like it's a, it's a um, more monitored, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, program than, than just allowing, you know, residents of one street to go onto the athletic fields, right? So. Can I ask when our next meeting is, Cheryl? I um, Wednesday. Apologize. Yeah, it's Wednesday. It's week from tonight. Uh, correct. So I would anticipate that should um, people wish to form, you know, yoga classes, dance classes, things like that, um, and make use of the uh, renting facilities of, from the town and presenting a plan to the health department, it should probably take at least a week to get that organized. Um, so my suggestion to the members of the board would be that we, um, we review both the written guidance from the state as well as any proposals um, at our next meeting. Comments from members of the board? I, that sounds good to me. Fine. Thank you. Mark? Fine. Okay. <laughs> All right. I believe we have reasonable consensus. Dr. Singh, I think you were also going to comment. No, I was just about to say that I'm good with your suggestion. Okay. And Dr. Jacoby? I'm good with this suggestion. Um, I'm just not sure how you keep the general public off the fields when you allow a business on the field. I, I wasn't suggesting that, Dr. Jacoby. I was just I was just pointing out that I, I think classes are, are, are easily more easily monitored. That's all. I mean in, in any way in order to open the fields we have to get the signage posted and so all users are aware of um, of the protocols. And I think I, I did hear you say, though, Cheryl, that there's a procedure in place for private organizations to rent the fields or part of the fields well, already. What I have in writing clearly just talks about holding outdoor classes um, at um, the field. So, I'll, you know what? Waiting a week is fine. I'll, I'll get um, what Mark's looking for in writing. Um, I'll get um, people that have already reached out to us. Um, I'll get them to send us their plans and I'll get them all in a packet for you for next week. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Okay, we're well, moving to our next agenda item. This is the one that generated a lot of uh, passionate discussion at the Lex next the last meeting. Um, just as a follow-up for any uh, board member or uh, that is not aware, uh, it turned out that this, I, I understand that this particular exercise um, turned out to be a, uh, uh, well, I don't wanna use the word moot, but it, but it turned out that um, nothing had to happen, so it, uh, was never exercised, didn't move forward. Uh, however, we I determined that we wanted to discuss the protocols at our next meeting, and that would be this meeting. And I think it's still worthy that we do discuss it because we should, you know, um, hash out what the limits and actions and so forth of this board uh, should be because we might be presented with the same conundrum in the future. Uh, so, Opening the discussion, uh, Cheryl, you had mentioned that you might or have offer a um, a suggested edit, but I didn't actually look to see if it was if it was in the packet or not. Yeah, uh, did, so I, I apologize. So um, when I put these protocols in place, the, for some reason, everything I sent that day, I made the changes, but they unfortunately weren't saving, um, and so everything I sent out. Um, basically was the original document unedited, even though I, I edited the document. So what I was suggesting, um, uh, Mr. Martin, if you can scroll down to the bottom of this protocol. Um, so what I had suggested uh, in lieu of, of what the board was um, hesitant about at the last meeting was basically um, getting rid of 4A and 4B. Um, and what I had done in my edit was do a strike through of those. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I have no access to uh, the Zoom right now. Oh, we can read it out for you, Dr. Bill. But um, okay, and I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable if we don't have a correct document that we haven't reviewed. I don't think we should vote on it. 
Uh, okay. Understood. Uh, this is actually, it's a deletion from the previous document, but um, but certainly if you're not comfortable, you would need and, to. And, and let me elaborate a little bit on the decision at the last meeting when we served an order. I followed up with the state, and it, at that time, that particular person had been tested uh, 12 days earlier. And therefore, was past the isolation period and didn't require anything. And the reason for that, we had no information at that meeting when the t day of the test was or even if the patient had any symptoms. So I, I'm very weary about just voting for something on the fly. Okay, understood. And uh, yes, as you uh, you said, I understand that you know it became a um, uh, unnecessary that we actually uh, sign the letter. I don't, Heather. Uh, excuse me, not Heather. Cheryl, you never signed the letter. I know I didn't. And no, I mean we did find out after that conversation that um, the quarantine, uh, the isolation order um, was either just expiring or had expired. So we did not send the letter to the two people. The reason I feel strongly about putting this back on the agenda is if we ever have another instance. So um, it would be helpful to have the board on the same page about, um, you know, uh, about the protocols that we should follow. Okay. So uh, just for uh, Dr. Bill's benefit, the and uh, unfortunately I've got the the uh, gallery of people here covering over part of it, but. But it's the very last paragraph, I believe, Dr. Bill, where we talk about the fact that if um, the person doesn't follow the Board of Health order, that uh, the board can petition the court to issue an order uh, mandating their compliance. And the uh, subparagraphs that Cheryl is suggesting that we delete uh, talk about what the potential consequences of that court order could be. Um, and, you know, Cheryl's suggestion is well, that's speculative because we don't know what a court would do if we, in fact, do petition a court uh, to issue an order. So that it's um, it's perhaps uh, uh, too aggressive to be listing the potential um, actions the court may order in a letter from the board talking about the board's order. Did I summarize that reasonably well, Cheryl? You did. But other than that, it would be the identical letter to what we um, we voted on last week, Dr. Bill. <clears throat> well, I, I had some difference with the with what I read, and <clears throat> I just wanted to make a general statement. Uh, there's a lot of confusion out there about the virus test, which tests if you're a case, and the antibody test which tests if you have recovered. And so I, I do want to say right now, everyone, every state's trying to test as many as they can. And what's starting to happen is they're counting the COVID virus test and the antibody test among all of their tests, even though they're, they're totally different and have different implications. And some of these states are doing that and sending their data into CDC, who has now published the cases, which is a mix of antibody tests and positive COVID tests. And now they're having to go back and dis discriminate and eliminate the antibody tests from the reported cases. So what I'm trying to say is there is a lot of confusion uh, as some of you may know, the FDA has now said 30 antibody tests are totally unreliable and are not allowed to be used, although they're not taking them off the shelves. So what we're saying in this, in this letter is if someone tells you you're going to isolation and you object, uh, we can have a court order and you can go to court. And if the court agrees, you can go to a hospital or a mental institution for the isolation. 
And I, I think there's a lot of chaos and uncertainty. There's a lot of politics involved. And I think we would be wiser to have a court order saying you have to get a test. So, uh, Dr. Bell, I just offer, I mean, I, I agree with you. That was the comment I was making last time, which is, you know, uh, I uh, had w saw several charts from the state, and they, they agree that this is a difficult situation. The antibody tests are, are um, put them in a, in a difficult spot. Um, the person could be infectious. They don't know. Consequently, you have to treat them as infectious, but they say. No, you don't. Well, that you know, is, no, is no, no, wait a second. Wait, let me comment on this. You know, we have a pandemic. There's a lot of unknown. It's a new virus. We don't know the characteristics. People are arguing that people could be carriers and never develop symptoms and infect everyone. That appears not to be true, although you can have pre-symptomatic spread. And what I'm saying is there are a lot of tests out there that have now been withdrawn. And earlier, the, gover the governor said the doctor should be ordering the virus test and the antibody test. If the antibody tests alone, they should test for the virus as well. Now, unfortunately, the doctors don't have any control over testing. People can get any test they desire. So I'm very uncomfortable with committing someone for 10 days to an institution for an antibody test, which has a low probability of infection, very low, probably about in the same league as you're picking it up on um, a calendar or something, very low. And I think as a group, uh, I, I would comment, the CDC is a federal organization, but when it comes down to enforcement, they make it very clear on their website. That's up to the state. And they give you a link to every state in the country. And then if you go to the state, they can have their policy, but the local Board of Health has the only authority to either incarcerate or hospitalize people against their will. Uh, well, so I would offer, well, I see Mark is going to comment, but Dr. Bill, I just offer, um, I, I've read the charts from the state and their uh, guidance is probably too soft a word. Their direction is that if there is a positive antibody test, they are to be treated as infectious unless they get a PCR test. And if the PCR test is negative, then they're negative. Everyone goes about their business. And which is that, what you said? That's, that, that's what I think the order should be. That's so okay. the order is they need to get the COVID virus test. And if that's positive, they need to isolate. Right. That, as I mentioned last time, several times, is the easy out that apparently these two individuals. That's not good enough. I am not willing to hospitalize someone against their will. They have the ability to go to the court to challenge it. The point is, the state says, you must go to health, enforce it for an infectious disease, and then we're required to do it. If the person is not agreeing, then, then let me finish, please. And once they disagree, they have the opportunity to go and to say to the court that it's inappropriate or something. You don't challenge the test until after you're isolated. If you're clinical, the order in the state says they must go into, go into isolation or quarantine. That's the requirement. You have to be I would, I would like to read the law to enforce it. You don't want to go into what the test results are. That's for DPH in the court. We're simply doing an administrative requirement that if they're positive, they're ordered to quarantine and isolate. If they don't, you take action and you go through the court process, period. It has to be clear for protocol for a public health standpoint, from a legal standpoint, and from a moral standpoint. It's clear and adamant. So at this point, I just like even, to ask. Well, even if the risk is one out of a million that you're positive, that you're contagious with just anybody? Bill, the point is you're arguing the test in the background. 
That's to be done with DPH. If somebody says, oh, they, this would be the same protocol for isolation quarantine, whether it would be for tuberculosis or COVID or SARS or for okay. Ebola. It's the same point. You isolate and then challenge it. You don't challenge it and then weigh it out and then say, oh, I told you so. You need to take the action and you do it to the legal process. You don't just say, I disagree, so I'm not doing it. You will, that, that is just civil disobedience and it's lawless. It's not appropriate. So at this point, I'd just like to suggest where maybe we should hear from uh, the director of the nursing service. Heather, do you wish to make a comment? Hi, sure, I can absolutely make a comment. Um, so this guidance that Nina Pickering Cook had put together in a letter um, with the protocol is directly from the state website. I can send you the Superior Court Rules and Administrative Director number 20-1, the protocols governing actions. Um, I'm happy to send that, but I'd like to make a comment so this isn't just about the serology. This is about people refusing to isolate when they are considered by the state and by testing a positive case. I have two positive PCR tested clients right now who are refusing isolation as well as two additional serology who are refusing isolation and refusing phone calls. This is not about driving to someone's house and putting them in jail. It is about sending a formal letter based on state guidance and directives to say you have to do self-isolation. If you don't, it then goes through the court process. No one gets arrested. No one gets put into a mental institution. It is guidance per the State Department of Public Health, and, and that is exactly what Nina went through. So for someone to say who's a positive PCR, I'm not going to isolate, then my I hands agree. are tied with them also. But with well, serology, I'm sorry, I'm going to finish. With serology, the positive test with no other information but also with previous testing that was greater than 14 days prior to serology testing, they are considered a positive per the state epidemiologist I have spoken with four times since last week. And the guidance that went out on May 22nd from uh, the epidemiologist department, specifically Hillary Johnson, and Scott Tropy. And this is based on the director's decision to make that serology reported as a positive case and has to be isolated unless they get a negative PCR. All of these things are explained when we call people. Each test, sputum, nasal, nasal pharyngeal, and what those testing requirements are and that they can be done in a 15 minute test. So to say that we're gonna go to their door and put them in jail or put them in a mental institution is absolutely absurd and is tying our hands as a public health department. Because to quote the, the, the epidemiologist the other day, if we're not doing this, we're not doing our job. Well, there's a lot of debate about that. I, I don't know that CDC is recommending this action. But, but Dr. Bill. But the state is. I was going to say, it's, I, I have. My job is to follow the state. I'm following the state, period. Well, good, good for you, okay. But <laughs> well, in the order, the way I read it before changes, you know, weren't made, it does, it does take them to court, I agree. And if... If the judge agrees with that, the next step is to force them into hospitalization for the isolation. I have no objection about if someone has a, has a PCR test positive, but I certainly agree with that. It's the antibodies in the gray area, because if you refuse to get a test, the PCR, I think you ought to get it. 
But if you don't, what if the antibody was one of those 30 tests that are now off the market? Then they should go get the PCR test, Dr. Bill. <laughs> they should. Which is why the state is not recommending any antibody testing, any antigen testing, because now the antigen testing is treated the same. The state is not recommending it. If you don't want to be put on isolation, get the PCR test at the same time, or don't get the serology done, because it's not correct. I agree. But employees are asking people before they come back to work to get a serology. Uh, so, Dr. Bill, again, it's we're not the business, you know, the business organization. There's If we have infectious people in the community that could be threatening the health and potentially the lives of other citizens of Acton, then we need to take action. I think that's what ultimately it comes down to. And no, if they no. can prove they're not infectious, then great. They can go about their business and with no interference from us. Right? I'd love to get out of people's lives, out of their face, so to speak. That's not the goal. But I'll quote the governor of New York who said one time, we have a public health emergency. Okay, This is a public health order, not a suggestion. Orders are enforced. And that means that we need to, you know, when it's an order, you're infectious, stay home. If you say, to heck with you, I'm not going to do it, then we're going to have to ratchet up the, um, the response a little bit. That's my opinion anyway. Mr. Martin. And so um, uh, my, my opinion here is a, uh, <laughs> a little bit uh, nuanced between these. So I, I want the, the point that I was trying to make last week is right now this guidance from town council is written for the board of health, um, and if the board of health wanted to designate someone else um, to be able to make these decisions, the board of health would have to specifically vote to designate someone um, to to do that. Um, my opinion and uh, uh, I, I share some of the same fears of Dr. Bill is that the, the, the Board of Health it would be fine if the Board of Health designated the chair to uh, do the earlier steps in this process. This is my opinion, right? The earlier steps in this process, specifically sending the letter. However, when we get to step four, I believe that um, this this guidance, the, the, the Board of Health needs to be completely involved um, to take to request that the town manager and the town council take legal action. Um, that 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 that's my opinion. So I do I strongly feel that the Board of Health should not designate any single individual to do any legal action as outlined in. Even if, even in the shortened proposed shortened step four, um, that that's that's my my main input. I have no problem that if if the the board wants to d designate someone to uh, specifically the chair uh, to send the the initial letter. Okay. Well, thank you for your comments, Mr. Martin. I I guess I would uh, just offer. Unfortunately, you know, if we have someone who is um, is infectious and uh, Dr. Singh, or well, actually, Dr. Taylor, anyone could comment on this. The um, I think it's called R zero or R not in the equation, but it's basically how many people you infect when you meet someone, when you meet a group. Um, so, if you were in a group of ten people, how many of them would walk away with COVID if you were COVID positive? And I believe the R zero on on COVID nineteen is four, meaning if you're if you meet a group about, of ten, it's about two. Oh, well, okay. Maybe that's so more recent data. And it, it's not entering a group of people. It's over time, how many individuals infect other individuals. And with the social distancing, we're down very close to one. And if it goes less than one, then it, 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 it collapses. But, right. But, 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 but right right now, or when we started, is mm -hmm. my understanding, uh, our not was between two and three. Um, uh, and, and it's over time. It's for the whole time that that person has the infection, how many people would they infect? 
And obviously, if one, if it's two, which is an uh, easy number to, to deal with, um, the, it, it, it grows geometrically, right? Each person infects two other person over the time that they have the disease, um, and uh, it explodes. Right. right, but if they stay home, they infect zero. So well, that's the goal. <laughs> so actually, we've, we've been doing a lot of staying at, at, at home, and, you know, not everybody, I understand, but it's down in the between 1 and 1 1.5, as I understand now. Um, it depends on the state. It's different for, for each state in the country. Um, but but I, I think it is extremely dangerous to say that the steps must be taken with no consideration of some of the details. Um, and I think that consideration of the details um, needs to happen. And again, I have no problem with the letter. It'll take someone time to respond to the letter. That gives the board plenty of time to call an emergency meeting if such a thing is needed. Um, uh, uh, I, I think it's hugely dangerous to be able to uh, designate an individual to make that call on step four. Oh, that, that's fine, Mr. Moran. I'll just tell you as, as chair, <laughs> um, I don't particularly want that awesome responsibility. So that's fine. Uh, I'm only concerned about the timeline. And you know, if you have if you have open um, defiance of an isolation order, then we have lost control. Don't know what uh, the path for infection might be. We need to fix that. And you know, time is of the essence, as the attorneys say. So, yes, yes. Just, but let me comment on that, Bill. Sure, Doctor. As Bill. this pandemic moves forward more information will come available, this policy at the state may change based on new information. Then we'll change. Yes, we will, but I want to be very reluctant about being heavy-handed at this point in time because these tests, you know, have limited reliability. So, so Dr. Bell, just for a second. Politics, more than science, is pushing the testing way up and the doctors have no control. You know, you can get a test tomorrow if you choose to. Well, yes. So, Dr. Bill, I heard Heather say that there are two PCR positives in Acton that are refusing isolation. I don't think that's an argument about the reliability of the test. I think we have. I'm not. That. I'm not arguing with that. I mentioned that when Heather reported that. But the order should be that if they have a test, then we push toward isolation. What I'm objecting to, the antibody test is a different characteristic. It's not, it's related to exposure and recovery and antibody development. I'm really reluctant to push that against someone who's stubborn and requires ultimately a hospitalization if he's going to be isolated. Or they get a PCR test. Dr. Singh, I see you've unmuted. Do you have something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, the PCR test is confirmatory, but the antibody test is not confirmatory because even if, like, the, since it is a novel virus, nobody was infected earlier with this. So as soon as the virus gets inside, or just an epitope or even a dead virus gets inside, the immune system is going to respond by starting producing antibodies. So antibody test is not confirmatory that the person is infected. But in some cases, there can be virus in the individual, but the immune system is strong, robust, and it is producing antibodies and taking care of all the infected cells. So again, like, if the person is PCR positive, then they should definitely be sent the letter for isolation. But for antibody test, uh, we can either just guide them to go for the PCR test. And that you all have already mentioned, and I completely agree with you on that, that the person who is PCR positive should be either going for quarantine by themselves or we can offer them the letter or whatever the next process is. So that's all I wanted to add. 
because that's the basis for vaccine because what they are doing for vaccine also and in the past also sometimes they use the dead virus to be injected to initiate the antibody production once the antibody uh, bodies are produced this primary response is produced this uh, 80% of those cells they die and 20% go in the memory pool and when the person is infected with the virus the secondary pool comes up and starts producing the antibodies against the virus so i just wanted to add this much and in the vaccine for coronavirus also they are using the, the messenger rna to produce the antibodies in the individual so when they inject those epitopes they produce antibodies in the individual they initiate the primary response and now if the individual gets infected with the virus they would have the cells ready to start producing the antibodies against the virus okay thank you dr singh so at this point what i heard uh heather say director york say is that we have four incidences in town two of positive PCR tests, two of positive antibody tests, um, and the individuals, those four individuals are refusing to accept an isolation order. So it would seem that um, this would be the point where a letter from the board would probably be necessary. Mr. Conaby. Yeah, I think we need to start at the first step. We have in indication and notification from the state that these people need to isolate and quarantine. If you contact them and they agree, we're done. Second step is you're not able to contact them, you send a letter. Seems harmless, it seems appropriate. The next step is if they contact them, they do not agree, they're defiant, you should administratively issue the letter. It should, it, I think that should be administratively done, designated, because writing the letter is simply enforcing the law. If they wish to say that that's inappropriate, that's when it's appropriate to have the situation where they can challenge it through the proper channel, which is through the court proceeding. And we can also have a Board of Health emergency meeting to talk about it, only if they're isolating quarantine during that time period. Otherwise, they're violating the law and they're exposing the public to a health risk. So I guess we need to separate all the different things. We have a situation now, we have individuals who are, we've been told by the state are positive, need to be isolated and quarantined, and they have not done so voluntarily. So you need to issue the letter immediately. Yeah, but positive virus is not the same as positive antibody. Well, That's it the, the, the question is simply whether or not the state says they must do it. Once the state says, you must do it, we must do it. You challenge the test in the court action, not now. You isolate and then do it. I don't think it's totally inappropriate to start challenging the test. It's like going and getting a speeding ticket. Well, I challenge the radar, so therefore I'm going to do what I want until afterwards. You stop. It's a little bit. The rules are changing in this pandemic. But they haven't changed in this situation yet, Dr. Bill. If the rule changes, we'll change. I promise. <laughs> right? But at the moment... Following what the state does and again, I'm, I'm not yeah. arguing about the positive viral cases. I'm arguing okay. about the antibody. But, but from the state's perspective, and as Mark says, from the law's perspective, there is no difference. And yet, those two people with the antibody, the serology test, have an easy out. Easy out okay 15 minutes spit in a tube okay and if they're negative they go home and we forget about it well so, when this goes to the court how much does the judge know about any of this well how will the judge make a decision the judge well <laughs> again dr bill you're straying way off of what the board of health charter is but i'll just offer the judges in in any court make decisions about things that they are not experts in. They rely on the attorneys that present the case on either side to be the experts and give them expert advice, and then they try to apply the law and make a decision. That's what they do on everything from, you know, assault to speeding tickets. Um, 
they're not radar engineers to use Mark's example, but yet they decide who's who's um, correct. Dr. Singh, I see you've also wished to make a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to agree with Mr. Connolly on that because once they are, first of all, why did they have to go for antibody testing if they didn't want to know whether they were positive or negative? And if we are, we are, if the Board of Health is suggesting them to go for the PCR test, then why refuse for the PCR test? They should be going for that if they don't want to go for isolation first. And if they don't want the PCR test, then they should self-quarantine themselves rather than having so much issue about it. Right. I, so, and so there only is one issue that the state doesn't address. I read several of their um, charts because the state recognizes they're they're creating a problem, they're getting significant blowback, but their position is firm. The one issue they don't address is the cost of the PCR test. So the only issue, the only rationale I can possibly come up with in my mind of why someone would defiant on isolating with a positive serology test but refuse to take the PCR test that would clear them is they don't want to spend the money. And I don't know if that's still true. I mean, that's a little facile. Some people don't feel that they want to do it or pressure to do something. There are a lot of stubborn people in the world. But Dr. Bill, they get a blood test that shows that they're, you know, positive, potentially positive for COVID, but they won't spit in a tube. I, I just, you're, you're right. There are people that do things for reasons I can't fathom, and I completely understand that's true. But ultimately... It's not the Board of Health's problem to solve their personality issues, okay? Get a, get a PCR test, go home happy. If you're COVID positive now, you're going, it's much more serious and you need to isolate. So arguing about the validity of the test when the state says you must, I just, I'm sorry, I, I can't, I, I may agree with you that the test is unreliable, but that's not our call. The people who get to make that call have made it. Dr. Singh, you were going to add something. Uh, no, I was just uh, about to say the same thing that you just mentioned. So I'm okay. good with the suggestion. Okay. Well, members, I would suggest, as, as always, this has been a passionate, passionate discussion. And, um, and even, uh, even the member of the select board is, <laughs> has uh, passion on the issue. But I would suggest uh, Director York has told us that we have four cases currently where um, I will put words in her mouth, but I believe she says it's appropriate that they be served with a Board of Health letter um, ordering them to isolate or get a PCR test in two of the cases. Um, so I would suggest that this is the time that we would uh, make a motion to authorize issuing those letters um, and we can do it in line with the way Mr. Martin or Mr. Connaby suggested, but I think that that time has come. Yes, Bill, I think we should be issuing the letters immediately following defiance in taking the actions required of isolation or quarantine. So I would say that we should be doing it administratively immediately during the emergency situation for that step. If there is and it should be said that if they wish to appeal, it, they have the right to do it. And if they wish to have an emergency meeting, they can do it. They can only do it while they're being in isolation and quarantine. Okay. Um, may I interpret that statement as a motion? Yes, sir. Thank you. So, and uh, and to borrow uh, something from your skill set, uh, Mr. Connaby, I'm going to sort of repeat what I heard you say which is that you make a motion that the, uh, the chair or the health director be authorized to sign a letter to the four individuals who are refusing isolation and that that letter be served on them as soon as expeditiously possible. Immediately. I guess I would say for the chair, the Board of Health through its agent designee, the health director or the nursing director. So one of those would issue the order, but it would be administratively done. And this would be for anyone going forward who also says we are, we're going to be in defiance of the state requirement of isolation and quarantine. They would immediately issue the order. 
So you wouldn't have to wait for another Board of Health meeting. It would happen administratively. The, the letter to go out, only the first, well, the second step. First is you notify them, the second is the letter. Okay, very good. Um, so that would be not just limited then to these four cases. It would be a practice or a procedure going forward. And then again, to follow uh, what I heard you say is then, should the uh, Board of Health order also be uh, refused or, or defined, then we would convene an emergency meeting of the board to consider next steps. Is that what I heard you say? Yes, but also notify this, the, um, TPH. So if an emergency order is warranted, uh, we take in that situation, you would take the appropriate act as required by DPH and state requirements. Okay, very good. So with uh, between the two of us, I believe there is a motion and hopefully it's clear to the other members of the board. I'd ask, uh, could you hang on just one second, Mr. Martin? Um, would ask, is there a second for Mr. Conaby's motion? I'll second it. Thank you, Ms. Bassetta. So a motion is made and seconded. Under uh, further discussion, Mr. Martin, I believe you wish to add something. I just want to ask ask a question. Um, or am I unmuted? <laughs> yes, yes um, you are. <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, it, it, I think you guys said opposite things uh, at one point, so I just wanted to clarify. For the sending of the letter, I believe that Mr. Conaby said it should be sent administratively by the director of the nursing service or by... Uh, 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 the direct board of health director, uh, I mean, sorry, the uh, health department director, and you said, um, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, that it should be uh, yourself or the chair of the um, uh, the board. So I think that should be clear. Oh, uh, so what I what I actually said was um, either myself, the chair, or the health director. Um, Mark, I had, that. I had suggested to be the the chair of the board of health or their designee specifically the health director or nursing director so we're clear so i i believe um that you, the board of health can designate somebody but that you can't designate somebody to designate somebody so you you, you can designate someone this is my understanding of the, what the, the law is but you can't designate someone to designate someone so yep. you, you 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 can say somebody is your designee for this purpose um, but it has to be a, a specific individual or title. So, Mark, you can go ahead. But what I heard, Mark, what I thought I heard Mark say was the chair or the health director or the nursing director. Was that correct, Mark? I, that was what I said. But I, I see Mr. Martin's point. I think we do need to be clear. So we can either make it the chair or we can make it the health director or nursing director. And I think it should be part. I think it should be part of the board of health. It's a good check, so I, I'm not against doing that. So why don't we try it? Because we are a small board. Why don't we make it? We designate that the, the chair to do it, and if that becomes a problem, we can revisit it. it seems fine. Okay, I was just looking for speed, and you know that would involve. Um, a step of having to get me the letter and get it executed and returned. Whereas in uh, the case of Cheryl, it could be done in one step. May, Mr. May, Martin. May I make one more suggestion? You, you might, in the wording of this, say that the chair has to approve, not sign. So especially that may make a difference in, in our current crisis. So they could send you an email and you could say, just reply to the email and say, I approve. That works. That works. Thank you. Good suggestion. So, um, Mr. Connerby, are you uh, willing to amend your motion and is along the lines of the further discussion? Yeah, I think we're trying to administratively make it happen as quickly as possible during the emergency situation. So, if you want to designate those two individuals, basically agent staff, and then have it with that way, with I think that's fine. And approved by the chair, I thought. Yeah. Yes, yes. I, I would authorize the health director or the nursing director to sign. Sign for him, that's fine. Yeah. Ms. Bassetta, are you uh, willing to um, 
Uh, second the amended motion? Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, if there is further discussion among members of the board. Dr. Taylor, I see you've lit up. No, I've, I've always been unmuted. Oh, okay. You Maybe you were sighing. <laughs> Um, it, it's on Zoom, you lit up. Anyway, um, then in that case, I'd ask, is there any comments or uh, discussion from members of the public? Hold on, sorry. I do have one hand raised. Um, I think it was raised a while ago, if you want me to call on them. Uh, sure. So this is TF, if you can state your name and your address, please. Hi. Sorry. It's All right. Go ahead. Nope, she's on mute still. Now she's not. Hi there, Hi. it's Chair from Weston. Um, I feel like the thing that's missing from the letter is um, it seems like very much like this is what we're going to do to you. Um, and it doesn't seem to say anything about what we do for them. So, for example, um, under state regulations, for example, when somebody's forcibly quarantined, um, the person is provided food, um, from what I understand, including any religious or special diet. Um, and it might be worthwhile um, making sure that, A, the town of Acton is providing for such, uh, but also in the order to make it clear, because it might be unclear to people uh, what would happen in the case of a quarantine. So um, that was one comment. Uh, the another thing is that uh, it's my understanding also under state law that they are, when they're forcibly quarantined, uh, that they get $2 a day. That was way back when, uh, I can't remember what year it passed, but it was uh, two-thirds of a working day salary or, you know, no more than $2 a day. But they are still, I believe, um, uh, they have a right to that. Uh, also, um, I was listening to the whole thing about the um, fitting in a tube and whatnot and you know, I personally would have concerns about giving my biometric data to who knows who, especially where there has been, there was a statement made on um, on one of these meetings that, that HIPAA doesn't apply or something like that. So I thought that was really interesting. But uh, what I was mostly worrying about or thinking about is whether or not the town provides um, or uh, ensures that a person has legal representation if they believe that they are, are being uh, forcibly quarantined for um, an unwarranted reason. So um, I think these are considerations at the very least to make sure that they know that they can get food. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Um, I guess I could ask uh, Heather to briefly comment, but I believe that, you know, those issues are, are normally discussed at the initial discussion of isolation. It's only they've moved past the point of of being interested in uh, how to affect an isolation, they have. Oh, you know. okay. Thank you. So, you're are you saying that that they know that they would get food and special food if they have a special diet or whatever, and that they now are refusing? Is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is, I know because I have um, experience in the process to, that in the initial contact, it's explained what their what an isolation entails and what their uh, resources in the community are available to assist them if needed. They ask things like, do you have someone that can get you food? If not, you know, we can help with that, that sort of thing. Oh, okay. It's when they say, right, to heck with you, I'm not doing it, that we're getting involved. Right. Right. Uh, now, uh, just a one more question. What happens if the person who is refusing isolation is in a, um, a high-density apartment building? Do the other... Um, do, do, do people have a right to know? I know that when we were working in the Katrina zones and there were um, a serious problem with, um, unfortunately, people who had died in their houses and they hadn't been removed yet, they put a big X on the, the, the doors so people knew that there was, um, you know, contaminated material is what they called it. Um, it, it when someone is in their quarantine, are the neighbors notified, I guess? Um, is it a different situation relative to privacy than... than um, you know, uh, when you're just affected or being tracked or whatever, I just like to understand that. Um, okay, again, I'm not sure that's on point to our particular motion at the moment, but um, 
I believe the answer is no, they're not uh, publicly identified, but Heather, could, could you just offer a yes or no? That's correct, Bill. No one is publicly identified. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate that. Okay. I believe it is. Uh, there's no other public comment, Cheryl? No. Very good. Then I think it's time to vote. Um, I'll work down the list this time. Ms. Bastetta, how do you vote? Aye. Dr. Singh? I, as long as we explain all the process to the individual beforehand. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Singh, I, I apologize, but it, it's difficult to have a conditional vote. I, I believe that is exactly what we are voting for. And if you have a question as to whether or not we explain the policy beforehand, uh, we should answer that question for you. But but your vote is either yes or no. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes, it is yes. And I suppose like the individuals who are antibody positive, they have been explained that they should be going for PCR testing. So I just, uh, I apologize for interrupting the voting, but, but uh, uh, Director York, Heather, can you can you just confirm that that's the case that you? Sure, Dr. Singh, the, our process is when we get notified of a positive case that needs to isolate, we make a phone call. If our phone calls are not answered and they are repeated, we send a official letter that says we need to get a hold of them based on their isolation requirement. They have our contact number. We send the isolation guidelines from the state, um, the guidelines per the state, um, and we mail that to their house requesting that they call us. But in the meantime, we continue to call them. Most times they will call us back and then we give them the information based on what the guidance is. If they can have the PCR testing to get out of isolation, we give that. We give information about food resources if they don't have the ability and we go through all the dates of when they would come off of isolation regarding both of those requirements. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, I do vote aye. Very good, thank you, Dr. Singh. Mr. Conaby. Aye. And Dr. Taylor. I vote no. Very good, I uh, vote aye, so motion passes four to one. Okay, thank you again. I'll, uh, I, <laughs> this, is, this is the difficult part of our job. Normally our job is more, um, you know, I'll say in the abstract, it's, it's dealing with things, you know, uh, potential sources of pollution, things like that, where we have time, we have um, ability of outside resources. This one, I, I have to say, is extremely difficult. I hope, um, I hope we are never forced to take this to the end. Um, I suspect that there's probably some towns in the Commonwealth that have had to do that. Uh, if anyone has any information on on other communities and how they've approached this, that would be helpful to know, but, but at least we'll, um, we'll start with this step. So, uh, okay, I believe we've concluded this agenda item. Uh, like to then move to the minutes of May 20th. I did have an opportunity to read them. Um, again, I think they're excellent. I have no comments. Ask if any other of the members have comments on the minutes of May 20th. No comments? Does anyone wish to make a motion to accept them? So no. Word. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> and anyone wish to second? Second. Very good, Dr. Singh. Thank you. Motion made and seconded to accept the minutes of May 20th. All those in favor, and I'll go down the order different direction this time. Ms. Bissetta. Aye. Dr. Singh. Aye. Doc, uh, Mr. Conaby. Aye. And Dr. Taylor. Aye. Very good. I also vote aye. The uh, minutes are accepted unanimously. Um, I believe this brings us to the end of tonight's agenda. Cheryl, do you have anything else to add? I don't. Very good. Um, in that case, at this time, probably a motion to adjourn would be appropriate. 
unless you know you're having so much fun you want to keep going <laughs> so moved. very good i heard a motion a motion to adjourn made and seconded um we'll work up the list this time dr taylor aye dr singh aye mr conaby aye ms Bassetta. aye and i also vote aye we stand adjourned thank you all again um this is not easy um we are we are being called to do more than more than I think we ever thought we would need to do when we signed up to be volunteers to help the town. But very much appreciate everyone's expertise and participation. And clearly everyone is fully engaged, which is which means that we should be getting the best possible decisions. So thank you all. Thank you to you, Mr. Martin, for hanging in there as our representative to the select board and um, at what must be at times uh, slightly, I'll say, uh, uh, arcane decisions, so <laughs> or um, discussions. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll second you guys. Do a, a great job, and having to consider all sorts of, um, you know, all, all these situations, and you know, none of the, none of the decisions are easy. So, all right. Well, thank you all, and thank uh, you. We will have our next. Uh, I'll see you all again virtually, in in a week from tonight. Thank you again. Good night. Thank you. Good night.